Robert Michels is key to understanding the process and structure of the internal and external life of political parties. His book, published in 1911, gives us an insight into the shortcomings of democracy and the psychology of political leaders and party members, as well as the masses. Throughout the book, it may seem as if Michels is anti-democratic and anti-socialist, as he seems throughout the whole book to point out the flaws in the real-world manifestations of these things. However, it is not the case, in fact, Michels describes oligarchy as a virus, and was at the time of writing this book a socialist. He later joined the Italian fascist party for what one may guess because he saw it as the only tenable option at the time. Nonetheless, this book is packed with tons of information, so if I miss anything, please let me know. Oligarchic Tendencies of Democracy As democratic parties grow and as democratic societies manifest, a contradiction occurs. That contradiction being that all democracies end up being oligarchic, and the reason for this is indeed quite simple. As any institution grows and becomes more bureaucratic, it makes more sense to have a fewer amount of people make the decisions, as if everyone had to participate in the decision making it would be impossible to get anything done. It would be impossible to get anything done or move forward because it takes time for people to come to a conclusion of what to do, and time is limited, and there would naturally be disagreement between all the people making a decision. On top of all this, it is important that all parties must organize. And they not only need to organize so that they can actually be a developed party, but they also need to organize so that way they can compete with other parties. And this is why they become oligarchic. As they are always competing with other parties, they, they must act quickly and efficiently. And only a select few can allow this. Otherwise, the process becomes too slow and stagnates. Thus, the chance of party defeat increases. Large groups especially cannot govern themselves. This would lead to a total chaos and a lack of order and they cannot mobilize in any meaningful manner. So therefore they, the masses, or what Michelle's calls quote-unquote the rank and file, need a leader to help them act in a unified manner, and this is especially seen in working class movements. Democratic institutions also, often also fail to uh, not turn oligarchical, because those running the democratic institutions are often incompetent and think short term, and these leaders often come from lower uneducated proletarian classes, so they're lacking in skill. Pragmatism overtakes idealism. As parties develop and become more advanced, they sacrifice their ideals in order to compete better or retain their status of power, if they've already achieved some, that is. Parties, in their infancy, tend to be more ideological because they can afford to do so, and they are not as entrenched in competition as other more matured parties already are. Michels gives us a few good examples of this with the conservative, democratic, and liberal parties. In the case of the conservative parties, they tend to put on a more democratic persona when they feel as if they're not going to be able to obtain power. Keep in mind here, the conservative parties of the time this book was written were more aristocratic. These conservative parties also tend to become revolutionary when they are removed from power entirely, where the norm for them is to be reactionary. They will also appeal to the lower economic classes of society, which they did not previously do before, in hopes that they can garner more support in an election. Liberal and democratic parties tend to always appeal to the masses and their party structure, and ideology often overlaps with pragmatism. The masses use as an excuse for power expansion. Throughout history, the hereditary transmission of power was the surest way for a class or an elite to maintain their power, as you are essentially passing down what you had at the time of your own to your kin, and they therefore own what you previously owned, which was some level of power and jurisdiction over others. If one wanted to maintain their power in an old aristocracy, they simply state that it is their right to hold the position that they hold. In more contemporary times, in which democracies are more prevalent, the leaders will simply state that it is their right to hold the positions they hold because they are the representation of the will of the people. They also say it is wrong to, to go against this individual because they themselves are a manifestation of the will of the people. Furthermore, these individuals, when they expand their power, they do so in the name of the people or anyone who is against them is said to be against the people. And the people side with them because they believe that the leaders represent them. Having the masses on your side is a very powerful tool. As when you go and stamp out other domains of power, you can say that if they oppose you, they oppose the people, and you also now have the people to back you up. Michel states Napoleon as a prime example of this, as he used the masses as an excuse to expand power. 
and he also states that the masses cannot remove him from power as they put him there, and this would be a contradiction. They would be contradicting themselves, essentially. It is also interesting to note that political parties that fight for a minority group tend to proclaim themselves as fighting for the entire world, when in reality, it is not the case. The reason is pretty simple, as if they get the masses on their side, it is easier to obtain power. The Dynamics of Inner Party Activity we have already mentioned that because parties need to organize and compete with other parties for survival, they become more oligarchical and more pragmatic rather than idealistic. This phenomenological shift affects the rest of party life. The party becomes more focused on mundane things rather than idealistic things. So bureaucracy grows and more party members are focused on doing work and maintaining quotas. As mentioned previously, the party becomes oligarchical as it has become organized. So now party members are also concerned with doing what their superiors demand of them. This has a negative effect as often the most idealistic members of the party leave it because their passion has been lost and often these parties can barely pay their campaign staff so all incentives are gone. Furthermore, as these parties fail, the members of the party do not want to admit guilt so they blame the external factors um, they blame external factors rather than internal factors. Tying back into the notion that pragmatism overtakes idealism, we also see a few members participate in the mundane. Most are only present with the party when things are easy and extravagant. Democratic parties are present in highly populated regions. This makes sense given the nature of democracy and these party members are usually on the front lines doing the hard work. So we see a decrease in party activity, the more difficult the work becomes and the more there's more activity in highly populated areas because there's more people to par participate in parliamentary or electoral politics there. The psychology of political leaders. Political leaders become concerned with pragmatism as the party matures, so this eventually becomes a very large priority. The leaders want to have the masses on their side always because this will help them maintain power especially in democracies. If the leader is famous before entering a political movement, this also benefits them because the masses already like them and the leader is often very concerned with the appearance because they want to appear worthy and legitimate. If a critique is leveled at the party, the leader of the party tends to take it personally as they equate their ego with the movement itself. And if the leader is directly insulted, they will proclaim that the insult is leveled at the party as a whole. The leader of the party, when they get in power, typically will, if the occasion arises, demonstrate the indispensability of their power. And they'll do this when the masses become dissatisfied or even party members become dissatisfied. They, the leader, will threaten to step down and the masses will panic because they know that if the leader steps down, he will appoint someone more unideal to the masses just to get revenge on them. Usually, this scenario occurs when the masses want a leader to adopt a certain ideology he does not agree with. So he wants to demonstrate that if they get rid of him, what he wants, and what he wants, they will have something worse. The old leaders of the party tend to be opposed to the new leaders because they signify that their time is up as a leader, and these new leaders tend to be more ambitious than the old. The new leaders often preach a new doctrine, and the masses adopt it, and it can often not align with the older one, and this is also an issue in the eyes of the old leaders. In order to prevent themselves from going out of power, the older leaders will inject themselves into younger movements. And it should be mentioned that the new leaders don't always last long either. This is because there are usually more older leaders in the party, and the new leaders bringing in new doctrine and threatening the power of the older leaders is a cause of concern, and basically the older leaders push them out. Finally, the newer leaders tend to value worth or skill more than experience like the older leaders do. So there is also a tension between two views of who should rule. Now this makes sense because obviously the older leaders are going to use experience to justify their place in power because they have experience and the uh, younger leaders are going to use worth to justify their power because they believe that they have worth. Now, Michelle states that both have their place, as the old have the experience, and the new can revive the stagnant old with their ambition. Leaders become more concerned with pragmatism, become less ideological, and become 
dispatched or detached from their base and no longer follow their ideals. Leaders also tend to leave as they become more interested in other things and themselves over time. The leaders will also be more demagogic to gain the crowd's trust, and thus a paradox occurs where in order to manipulate the crowd, they obey them, but disobedience is trivial at best. The Psychology of the Masses The masses not only need a leader to be mobilized, they desire a leader as well. The masses themselves are willing to give up power to a minority just so that they can have their problems be taken care of and a better state of affairs established. The masses do not desire just any leader. They desire a good orator, and they desire someone who will help them be filled with hope. The masses as a whole are usually politically indifferent, and they are self-interested, so they tend to follow whoever appeals to their collective self-interest the most. They also tend to venerate the leaders, and Michel point, points out how this veneration of leaders varies by degree. In Europe, he claims that in the Latin countries, this veneration is more prevalent because they, for example, the Italians, have a history of treating their emperors like gods, so they are more inclined to do this, and he gives the example of Italians naming their kids uh, after Lassell, who was a uh, socialist. Lassell, as well as holding the Christian cross next to the flag of their agrarian socialist parties. The veneration of leaders by the masses is, al is also very latent, as we see when any criticism is leveled at a leader, the masses are quick to defend them, and the most obvious manifestation of this uh, is revolutionary violence by the masses for the leader. Once again, having powerful speaking skills is very important, and the masses will view speakers as almost important as almost more important rather than those who do hard work behind the scenes. The leader now being venerated by the masses also allows him to project what he wants onto the masses, and the masses will follow along within reason, of course, but nonetheless, uh, they want to impose their will, or, sorry, the, um, the masses find it easier to impose their will on a leader who's going to basically um, advocate or cater to them. The use of the media and the press by political leaders. The media and press is a great weapon used in the battlefield of political parties, as one can use it to send a general message to their audience and have it represent the party as a whole, and they can use it to anonymously attack their opponent. The leader of a movement can use the media to publish an article, and this article can spread fast, and this can be a great way of spreading the message of the movement on a mass scale. And it can also be said that it is useful for the leader because they can use this medium to make any declarations they want. They can use the media to attack their opponents in many ways. They can do fake news and slander a party, and nobody will know that the party is behind it if they attribute the article to one author. Especially, they can also use the news to make themselves look good in the eyes of others through lying about their achievements and a bunch of other things. The Impossibility and Corruption of Socialism Socialist parties, according to Michels, suffer from the same ailments that all other political parties suffer from, those being oligarchical manifestation, pragmatism, overtaking idealism, etc. In the case of socialism, however, this natural turn toward oligarchy is bad because oligarchy is a contradiction to the principles of socialism, but the issue is that this oligarchical manifestation is needed for any party to survive, so the socialists are in a quagmire. This naturally causes many socialists to leave the party, as they do not see their ideals being met. There is also another issue, and it is that the socialist movement's leaders often start out as proletarians themselves, but after they get involved in political life, they lose their proletarian mindset, since the life of the political is usually already filled with bourgeoisie, they end up undergoing a psychological transformation and become more like the bourgeoisie themselves, and they thus lose touch with their base and their roots, therefore letting the party down. Sometimes even pure bourgeoisie allies themselves, um, or they will ally themselves with the socialists. But this too creates the phenomenological issue that the higher classes cannot understand the lower and therefore do not make a good representative or representation of these movements. The socialist parties, like all parties, tend to become bureaucratic, and thus we see high-ranking members in the party, once they secure their position, they no longer become interested in the ideals, rather they, be, they care 
about their salary and personal gain from being in the party. The issue becomes even worse when we realize that most members of the party do this work without pay, and the parties are underfunded, as well as so many socialists end up leaving the party, as there are no incentives to be offered, unlike in workers' unions. In Europe, a lot of members of parliament at the time did not get paid either, so this also gets rid of any incentive for proletarians to gain power, and if they did get paid, a lot of money has to go back into the party. The aristocrats can handle not getting paid and working in government because they are by default already rich, so they don't really have any financial concerns. The bourgeoisie allies of the socialists, due to the previously mentioned fact that the proletariat are less educated and the bourgeois are more educated, they tend to be able to take the ideas of the proletarians and turn them into a coherent ideology, and this is because they are more educated, but also they have more free time on their hands, whereas the proletarian is often occupied and tired from work. Michel's claims that even some of the best revolutionary theorists during the French Revolution were of bourgeoisie origins, such as Rousseau. There are many reasons as to why the bourgeoisie ally themselves with the socialists. It can either be because they genuinely sympathize with the movement, and they typically get a lot of backlash from their family, and usually their older family because the sympathizers tend to be younger. They could also ally themselves because they feel jealous or betrayed by other members of the elite, and finally, they could also want to subvert the movements and just be bad actors. Michels does state that the socialist parties can gain from a bourgeoisie ally because he will know how the other elite act and can help guide the movement and avoid obstacles. In regards to subversion of the movements, we often see that the elite will allow the socialists to have some power, but not full power, in order to tame them and not let them get the upper hand. They will also inject themselves into movements and try to change the ideology to be less revolutionary and just try to tame them once again. There are different types of bourgeoisie, the higher and middle ones, and the middle ones are easier to win over to your side, and the movements are usually either guided by them or what Michels calls ex-proletarians. These bourgeoisie tend to be younger and more idealistic rather than pragmatic, and they also tend to fetishize the proletarians. They see them as helpless little children, so to speak, and they idealize them. The bourgeoisie allies tend to be more radical as they are younger and have more time to be ideological than the proletarians do. And in regards to the ex-proletarians, -pro they become ex-proletarians because once they go through the life of the political and the bureaucracies, they start to make more money uh, and they also, once again, start to adopt this bourgeoisie mindset and they're doing not hard labor, they're doing more abstract intellectual labor. So they kind of become, once again, um, detached from their base, from their roots. How elites decentralize. When a disagreement between the oligarchs occurs, a schism follows, and thus the elites decentralize. When they decentralize, the new institutions do not become less oligarchical, they are just as oligarchical and uh, they are just slightly smaller than the previous ones beforehand. The elites, in order to prevent themselves from going out of power, create a high entry barrier, and they do this by dividing themselves into the ins and the outs, the ins being the old elite members and the outs being new elite members, and the outs want to naturally become ins, but the ins try their best to prevent the, the outs from becoming in, and we saw this before with the party. One may also think that the elites can be decentralized or replaced through democratic means, but this isn't the case. As we see, for instance, in America, which has the most democratic institutions, the same people still rule and they secure their position over time by injecting the children, their children, or their co-workers' children into higher ranking positions and eventually becoming a leader. Even the masses revolt. The elite are very good at tranquilizing this because only can they overthrow the elite when the elite pursue a policy that is detrimental to the relations between social classes or other elites who side with the masses because of this. Under a monarchy, the monarchs, if sinned against, would tell the masses they are sinning against God's divine right, the king. But now under democracy, they say that if you sin against the leader of a mass movement, you sin against the will of the people, which becomes a new god, so the masses can be used against other elites by elites, essentially, is what's going on here.
anarchism, cynicalism as prevention. Michelle states towards the end of the book here that we see many anarchist movements and cynicalist movements as preventative measures towards what he calls, quote-unquote, the virus of oligarchy. The issue is, is that these movements as well become oligarchic. In the case of these cynicalists, they realize this and do not want anyone to represent them. Rather, they advocate direct action. But the issue is, is that in order for direct action to occur, this requires oligarchy. In the case of trade unions, we see this issue where the unions have a head or a leader who acts on behalf of the collective will and they eventually become detached from the base and the base kind of rejects them as their leader. In the case of the anarchists, we see that they will never get anywhere because they behave, or sorry, they believe in non-hierarchical organization, which is impossible and they are much removed from reality and they're too idealistic and naturally people fall towards authority, like we saw with the masses. Michels also states that uh, cynicalist movements, anarchist movements, you know, these movements that try to organize in a way that's non-hierarchical to avoid oligarchy, well, he says they really can't compete with other parties because you have all these, these men that are, no one's guiding them, no one's organizing them. It's like having a bunch of soldiers without a general on the battlefield. It doesn't really work. Conclusion. You may think that from all of this that Michels is anti-democratic, but in fact he is pro-democracy and at the end of this book advocated still continuing with the democratic measures in the hope that he can have some minor effect in societal or political improvement. It is interesting that he comes to the conclusion, though, as he himself believes that when elites are replaced, it is not through mass movements, rather it is through the old elite slowly integrating the new over a long period of time. We ourselves can conclude that all movements become oligarchical, and the only way to win in the game of politics would be to become oligarchical and become integrated into the ruling class over time. 